divorce is a very sensitive subject for Christians here in our Western culture. And it's a very sensitive subject because even though in the West, 90% of people marry by the age of 50, upwards of 40 to 50% of marriages in America alone end up in divorce according to the Encyclopedia of Psychology. And the divorce rate uh, for subsequent marriages, second and third and fourth and fifth is even higher. Uh, almost as though there's a direct correlation between the number of times you've been married and your likelihood for it to end up in divorce. And the divorce rate among Christians, uh, practicing and professing Christians, is not lagging too far behind in the culture. Because divorce is commonplace and has been normalized in our culture. It almost seems like with every passing generation, the culture and society becomes increasingly more secularized, and as it replaces a conservative, traditional, even biblical views of marriage and divorce with more progressively liberal views of marriage and divorce, the divorce rate just keeps going up. It's not even a sensitive issue for people in society anymore, quite frankly. Far from it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's celebrated. It's promoted all over the place in our culture. All you need to do is turn on the television and you see this actor or that musician or this athlete and that famous person on their third or fourth and fifth marriage and so on. The signs for divorce lawyers when you're driving down the freeway, on the road, or in any area, a business, a storefront, you see street signs all over the place. So-and-so divorce attorney, only $500. Divorce is easy, divorce is cheap, it's trendy, it's accessible, and it's convenient. Not happy with your wife? No problem. You can get a new one for the small price of $500. Not happy with your husband? Don't worry. Just sign on the dotted line and you'll be legally single and ready to mingle and start looking for another. The cavalier view of divorce in the world around us is pervasive. It is everywhere. And I'm here to tell you this morning that this is nothing new. It was no different with the Jews and the Judaism that dominated Jesus' day. Divorce was easy, at least if you were a man. All you had to do was give your wife a certificate of divorce and you were free. And we see that in the text this morning. Though there were a few different views on what the appropriate grounds for divorce were among the Jewish religious elite, all of them agreed it was permissible. And even though the Pharisees' question this morning is disingenuous and they have a, a hidden deceptive motive to try to entrap Jesus, the question remains, and it's one that Christians like you and me must wrestle and face today. How should we as Christians approach divorce? How should Christians, those who believe in the biblical Jesus and follow the biblical Jesus, understand and approach this controversial issue of divorce? Answer, by seeing and submitting to Jesus's, which is to say God's answer about the question of divorce. And we do that by opening the pages of the Bible to the gospel of Mark chapter 10 and verse 2, where the Pharisees come to him seeking to entrap Jesus with an important question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And by extension for us today, for a wife to divorce her husband. And I think Jesus' answer to this question is going to take many of you by surprise. I think even Moses' answer to this question is going to take many of you by surprise. So go with me to Mark 10, verse 1, which says this, and he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan 
And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. So he left there. Where is there? Well, if you follow the chronology in chapter 9, up to verse 33, he'd just been in Capernaum. So he's leaving Capernaum. And in this previous section, Jesus has been giving his disciples a re-education about what kingdom greatness looks like, the cost of discipleship and of following him. And what pure and true and unadulterated devotion to him looks like. And so he'd just been in Capernaum, which is Galilee, the northern region, which served as his de facto headquarters for the first two, two and a half years of his ministry. And so from there, he's making his way south to the region of Judea, towards Jerusalem, the great and capital and holy city. He had Galilee in the north, Judea in the south, and he left there, and he's coming down south, and from his perspective, he crosses over west into Perea, from Mars, geographically, he's going east, crossing the Jordan into the region of Perea, and that's where he is, and notice it says, again, as was his custom, He taught them. In Mark's gospel, he has a habit uh, not of telling us so much the content of Jesus' teaching as much as the fact of his teaching. He likes to do that. He doesn't give us the content always, more so the statement that he's teaching or he's a teacher, and it's the same in this case. And then he follows up with a controversial conversation that will likely occur as a result of what he's just been teaching. And it's the same here. In verse 2, the Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The Pharisees, as you'll recall, are part of the religious elite in Jerusalem, in Israel, and they've been dogging Jesus' steps almost since the outset of his ministry in search of some kind of accusation against him that they might use to arrest him, put him in a kangaroo court, and ultimately execute him because he's their enemy. They're jealous of his persuasion and influence over the people. They're jealous of his powerful teaching and oratory. And they're jealous of his miracle-working ability. And since chapter 3, verse 6, they've been out to get him. You see that even in Mark's gospel. And notice, this is not a genuine question. Is not coming out of a good motivation from their heart and really wanting to understand what is God's view and perspective on the matter of divorce. It says they came to test him. Same word in the Greek for tempt, perazo. Test, tempt, they're used interchangeably. They got a pretext here. And that pretext is to try to entrap him into saying something that they might use against him. You see that in that word alone. And no doubt even in the reality that they knew the answer to this question. They knew what the Old Testament taught about divorce in the one sort of obscure passage in which it's fleshed out in some kind of detail and applied. To them they knew in their minds it was permitted. What they disagreed on was the grounds upon which exactly it was permitted or not permitted. And Jesus, as the most practical preacher who ever lived, in his two and a half years till now, no doubt had taught them exactly what his view was on marriage and divorce and relationships and the gender roles, family. They must have heard this already and known exactly where he stands on this issue. So then why are they asking? They're asking to test him. And notice, it's not just them in on this likely, They're asking him in Perea. Why is that important? Why is the question of divorce important in this setting in Perea? Well, those of you who were here with us last week heard a sermon back from Mark 6, 14 to 29, in which Herod Antipas 
ends up beheading John the Baptist. And he does so reluctantly in a drunken stupor because he made a promise to his daughter-in-law that he would give her up to half his kingdom, whatever she might ask, because he was so pleased with her belly dancing for him and his male companions and magistrates. And what does Salome, his daughter-in-law, ask for? The head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. Why? That was at the behest of her mother. And her mother, as you see here in Mark 6, look at verses 18 uh, to 19. Herod fearing, feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. I'm oh, sorry, back to 18. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. That's why Herodias was Herod Antipas's brother's ex-wife. She was married to Philip, his brother. And John the Baptist was saying, not only is it wrong that you're married to a divorced woman, but this divorced woman happens to be the ex-wife of your first brother, your full brother, and this is wrong. And Herodias hated John the Baptist for this, and she put her daughter up to that plot, which ended up in success to execute and behead John the Baptist. And so you see what's happening here. You piece this together with what Mark tells us in chapter 3, verse 6, that the Pharisees and the Herodians were in on this. The Herodians were the socio-political uh, followers of Herod. And Herod Antipas happens to be the tetrarch of Perea. So Herod the Great was his father. And when Herod the Great had died, he split up the kingdom of Judea into four parts. That's what tetrarch means, ruler of a fourth, or ruler of a fourth part. And his son, Antipas, happened to get Galilee and Perea. And so this is happening in Perea here. And so I think what the Pharisees see is a perfect opportunity for them to try to entrap Jesus on a controversial issue that just got John the Baptist beheaded because maybe, just maybe, if he says the wrong thing, we'll go back and report it to Herod. Herod will arrest him and also have him executed as he did his cousin John the Baptist. I think that's what's happening here. And so they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And how does Jesus answer them? What did Moses command you? Verse 3. And that is the, the right response. That's the right approach on this or any other issue in faith, in doctrine, in practice, in life. What does God say? What does the word of God say on this issue? What does the word of God in scripture say? Because God has spoken to us and he has spoken to us clearly on all matters that he knew we needed to know about, starting with creation, redemption, life, sin, and even practical issues in life, like marriage. What does the Bible say? Not only what does the word of God say in scripture, specifically, Jesus says, what did Moses command you? What did Moses command? That's a precept. That's an imperative. That's something to be adhered to and obeyed. What did Moses command? What did Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, which superintended the writing and recording of all of Scripture, Old Testament and New, including the law, the Torah, which you Pharisees know by heart. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You've had it memorized since 12 years old. What did Moses, in God's law, command you? It's a good question. Look at their response. They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And notice they, they change Jesus' words here. He asked them, what did Moses command you? And they say, Moses allowed a man, permitted a man. It's almost as though they're conceding already that they know Moses did not command this in God through Moses. He merely allowed and permitted it. Two very different things. 
And in what text are they referring to here? Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. They're right. They know God didn't command it. He allowed it. And just how or what did he allow? And for that, you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24. Verses 1 to 4. Listen to this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house and if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife then her former husband who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she's been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So here we have a scenario. And the scenario is a man has a wife and he finds some indecency in her, some immorality, perhaps it's adultery, maybe she lied about being a virgin, and he says, I'm sending her away. He says, write her a certificate of divorce first to make it official, and she's gone. And if she goes out again and then remarries, and her second husband hates her, which means despises her, or doesn't want to be with her any longer, he can also send her out, but if he does, she cannot go back to the first husband. That would be an abomination to the Lord. That's the scenario you have here. And so what you see, first of all, is that there's no particular grounds sanctioning a divorce here. It's not about command. This is God allowing. This is God condescending down to fallen humanity, knowing that after sin entered the world and death through sin, everything in the world was corrupted. Men, women, marriage. And it's not always going to work. And the sin inside of us is sometimes going to lead to people wanting to separate, and in this case, men. So this is not God's sanctioning divorce. It's God allowing a provision for it, knowing inevitably and invariably in a fallen world filled with sinful, totally depraved people, this is going to happen for one reason or another. And specifically in this case, more than anything, by the way, this was a provision to protect the women. This was to protect the women so that they would not be taken advantage of. So that a man who on any whim just wants to send his wife away and he has a, a change of heart, she goes and remarries, but her husband either dies or he divorces her and maybe she comes upon an inheritance or he wants that dowry back. He can't go back and then remarry her again because that's what would happen. That was a very patriarchal society, male-dominated, male-benefiting. And this, more than anything, is to protect the women from constantly being taken advantage of and being dealt with so trivially and loosely. That's, that's what's here. And that's all that's here. Notice, there's no grounds. It doesn't talk about when it's allowed why it's allowed, what specific ground upon it's allowed, and what circumstances it's allowed. It doesn't talk about any of that at all. And the Pharisees knew that, by the way. The Pharisees knew that, and so what did they do? From these short, obscure four verses, they developed the whole theology of divorce in their oral law and one of its tractates in the Mishnah, which is one of their oral laws. That's what they did, an entire tractate. And there was three main views that dominated in that society. The first view by a rabbi named Shammai, his view was the more conservative view. And his was that the only ground permissible was that one in 24 verse 1, the, the indecency. If it was immorality, adultery, maybe she lied about being a virgin, whatever the case was, that was the only grounds upon which it's okay. And then came Hillel, the rabbi, with a more progressive and popular view, where he loosely interpreted this indecency to be pretty much anything. 
It didn't just have to be adultery or immorality. It could have been anything. It could have been that she served your dinner plate too cold. It's in there. It could be that she flashed too much ankle as she was walking by to another man. It could be that she spoke to another man that was not her husband in public. It could be that she spoke to his mother in a disparaging way for all you mama boys out here. And on and on and on it went. And so, of course, that being the more flexible interpretation, that was the most popular one. And then came another rabbi, Akiba, and his, his takes the cake. His was purely superficial. His was, you could send her out by giving her a certificate of divorce if you found another woman, quote, more fairer than she, end quote, A.K. more beautiful. So you no longer found her attractive. Just send her out. Those were the views. That's what they had interpreted as grounds, though as you saw in that single passage in the Old Testament, there was no grounds. No grounds at all. God didn't sanction it. He allowed it. He conceded it, knowing they would do it anyways. And so he gave them some parameters, by and large, to protect the women from being taken advantage of one too many times. That's what's there. And quite frankly, those views, especially the second and third one, they still dominate our society today, don't they? Not much has changed in a couple thousand years. But for most Christians, at least those who are practicing their faith, you know, you made a profession of faith, you've been baptized in a public de declaration of faith, you identify with the local church, community, an expression of the new covenant community and life that we have in Christ. We may be subscribed to that first view, right? Only on the grounds perhaps uh, of adultery or death, which are the only biblically delineated legitimate grounds of divorce, which we'll see a little bit more last week. Or God forbid, if there's terrible abuse, we have that view, the, the more conservative, faithful, Bible-believing Christians among us. But not so with others. Right? Not, not the nominal Christians. Not the rest of society, certainly. No, they like the other two views. Right? I, I just don't know what it is, but there's something about our personalities. Uh, we just don't click anymore. I don't see the compatibility that I need I don't know if I can continue in this marriage. I think we need a divorce. I don't know what's happened over the years. Something's happened. We've grown apart. I feel like I don't even know you anymore. You feel like you don't even know me anymore. You're not the same person you were when we first got married. I can't be with you anymore. I want a divorce. Or you find all the smallest, most insignificant, inconsequential things to use as excuses. I hate the way she crunches so loudly her cereal in the morning. Or when crunching on those chips drives me nuts as we're, we're watching a movie. Every little thing that they do annoys me. The way they walk, the way they talk, there's no love anymore. I don't get that feeling anymore. I'm out. Or the last one, oh, you know, you're just not quite the same woman you were when we got married. You know, you've gotten older, we've had kids together, you don't look the same, and I think I need to find something else. I'm just not attracted to you anymore in that way, and I can't be with you. It's the same today. Right? That's why divorce is so pervasive today, isn't it? When you have a cheap and superficial understanding of marriage, and it's the exact same reason the Pharisees and the Jewish men in Jesus' day were so eager to divorce and looked for every possible reason to pull the escape hatch so they can find someone better, so they are free to marry someone better, someone smarter, someone more beautiful, someone more better looking, someone different. Just wanting to be with someone and experience something different. It's not necessarily that people don't want to be with their husband and wife. It's that they're constantly searching for something better, isn't it? The next best thing, as though the grass is greener on the other side, but it's not. 
It never is. You end up with another man who, by and large, by God's design, in many ways, behaves just like your first husband and is just as insensitive to your emotional needs and your insecurities as your first. And he even forgets to put the toilet seat down. And men, guys, they end up with another woman who, by God's design, again, in many ways, behaves exactly as his first wife, who is sensitive and needs attention and affection and words of affirmation all the time and who nags on you from time to time, every day, every few hours for some of you who have it bad. But it's the same thing. And that's exactly my point. You never end up finding exactly what you're looking for. No matter how many times you push the eject button on your marriage, you're never going to find perfection because you yourself are so imperfect. And it takes two. You don't learn to fly an airplane by following the instructions on how to make a crash landing. And the same is true for marriage. You won't figure it out and a way to make it work by focusing on your exit strategy. Nor will you figure it out by divorcing and remarrying more and more times as though the number of times you've been married, more numerical experience, as it were, with marriage and divorce is going to help. And that, again, by God's design. God has designed men and women uniquely, differently, yet complementarily. Right? Like the age-old saying, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And to put that in Christian terms, what that means is, men are from dust, and women are from man's rib. And we'll look at God's design, uh, God's intention, more for marriage next week, when we look at the the rest of the text. But now that we know what the view of divorce was in Jesus' day, and what the view of divorce is in our day, not much has changed, the question is, what is God's view? But he didn't sanction it. He allowed it. But what does God think about divorce? Now that we know, at the very least, it was never his will or intention for marriage. So what does God really think then about the issue of divorce? And to understand that, you got to turn with me to Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi is the last book in the canon of the Old Testament before the New Testament, the last word of God before a period of 400 years of silence where God was no longer giving any new revelation in Scripture to his people Israel, by and large because of their sin, but yet the plan of redemption continued. And so Malachi writes here as the last of the 12 minor prophets, and he writes this short prophecy to Israel during a time that they had returned from exile in Babylon and built the second temple, and they had yet again been struggling with apostasy. Uh, with covenant unfaithfulness, with divorce and remarriage, and specifically intermarrying with other peoples who served other gods. That was a major problem. That was the time of Malachi. And Malachi was also written around the same time as Nehemiah, if you know the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, to give you a bit of a chronology with the exiles. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom Israel was taken into captivity and exile by Assyria. And then 586 BC, the southern kingdom Judah finally fell also to the Babylonians. They were dispersed, they lost their culture, they lost their language, and yes, they lost the law of God. But God, sovereignly in control of even a king like the Persian king Cyrus in 538 BC, which Isaiah prophesies hundreds of years before, would set the people free and allow them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple, does just that. In 538 BC, Cyrus issues a decree. He allows them to go back, and the first wave goes back in 538, and they begin the reconstruction of the temple in the city from 536 to 516 BC. About 20 years it takes them to rebuild this grandiose and opulent second temple. And then a second wave of exiles is permitted to return. In 458 BC, under the leadership of a priest named Ezra, who writes Ezra and Nehemiah, 
And he comes back and he brings sweeping reforms. He recovers the word and the law of God in scripture. He teaches it and reads it publicly to the people and he seeks to hold them account. He restores the sacrificial system and the priesthood. And he brings about great reforms. And he finds them in a place of great apostasy. Listen to what Malachi says here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. This was the current state of Israel after they returned from the Babylonian exile. 2 verse 10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord. The God of Israel covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. And I think the NASB, better than the ESV, actually brings out the better translation in verse 16, which says, I hate divorce. I hate divorce. And he hated divorce because the Jewish men in Israel were issuing certificates of divorce on a whim so that they could take and marry foreign wives whom God knew worshipped other gods and would lead them astray into idolatry. It was a huge problem. And he's calling them back to faithfulness to him in Malachi but it wasn't just the people. It was the priests too, the religious leaders. And this you see in Nehemiah. Listen to what Ezra says here in Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13. Uh, beginning in verse 23. In those days also, I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them, and cursed them, and beat some of them, and pulled out their hair. Now notice, this is not sanctioned, absolutely, for any men to be abusive to other women or your wives or otherwise. This is not what he's saying here. I think more than anything, this is Ezra grabbing the men by the hair, pulling their hair out and punching them in the face. That you might have a little bit of license to. If they're leading people away from God. So he's pulling their hair, he's punching them, he's beating them, and I made them take an oath in the name of God saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made him even to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Even the priests were doing Doing this. This was rampant. This was a major problem. And, and look at the instructive example, the best example that anyone could ever give that Ezra gives to us. It's Solomon. Solomon. The wisest man who ever lived. 
And what did all his wisdom do for him in the end? He started off so well. When God says, ask me and I'll give you anything. He says, give me wisdom to govern your people in an understanding way. And God is so pleased. He says, not only will I give you wisdom so much so that none who's come before you or will come after you will possess, but you'll also be the wealthiest king in human history. And he gave him all that. And because God promised it, his promises are irrevocable, which means he left his spirit of wisdom and the riches with Solomon. And what did all his wisdom do for him in the end? Go to 1 Kings 11. Not long. In just a few years, he gets a little older. He gets a little more permissive. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods gods. And here it is, verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. The consequences of Solomon's covenant faithlessness and marrying so many foreign wives you say, oh, I didn't recognize all these Canaanite countries here, Ammonites, Hittites, Moabites. You might recognize Moloch. To Moloch, he built a high place. That's a temple. Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. Why is Moloch an abomination of the Ammonites, uh, to the Ammonites? Because upon the altar of Moloch, the Ammonites were sacrificing children. This is God's chosen king. And he builds for his foreign wife, an Ammonite, a high place to Moloch. What are we to understand here? That child sacrifices were made there in the name of Yahweh, the one true living God? Maybe. But if not, it was completely detestable to God. And judgment was coming as a result. How, how terrible. How horrible. That's what God thinks about divorce. That's why he hates divorce with his people Israel first and foremost. Because they were handling and understanding marriage so cheaply that for any reason I could get out. And worse, looking for ways to get out so they could marry a foreign wife for whatever reason. That maybe they found more attractive. And invariably, that foreign pagan religion would lead them astray. And that's what happened. And it's still happening today. For one reason or another, maybe even good reason, or maybe it's adultery, infidelity, where someone, a Christian wife, leaves her husband who committed it, a tragedy nevertheless. And out of desperation, loneliness, insecurity, Maybe feeling like no other Christian man would ever want me. I'm used goods now. She ends up settling for an unbeliever. Oh, but he's really nice. 
He's really chivalrous. He treats me so well. He pays for my dinner. He opens my car door. He tells me he loves me every night and texts before bed. We FaceTime. Oh, and he's even been coming to church with me. Sometimes. And from my experience, my personal experience with people that I know very close to me in my life, friends and family, it never ends up well. I've seen this happen more times than I can count on one hand. I need two now for friends and family. More often, it's not necessarily remarriage, but it's the initial marriage to begin with and the events leading up to it. The girl was lonely, a young Christian woman. Maybe she'd been hurt in the past, whether by a supposedly Christian young man or just a, a regular worldly unbelieving guy. She's lonely. All of her friends are getting married. She feels like she's getting older. She doesn't want to miss her boat before it's too late. Her biological clock is ticking. And even though she knows better, her parents warn her, her friends and family tell her, her church tells her the same. To learn from her mistakes in the past, she refuses. And she ends up giving the guy she met on school campus or at the coffee shop who constantly keeps asking her out and is persisting and persisting. She finally gives him a chance. Oh, he was so persistent, so I couldn't help it. And I decided to finally give in. And I gave him a chance. And we went on a date. And I started to get to know him. And he started to get to know me. And I felt like he really liked me. And before I knew it, I really liked him. And now I love him. And he even comes to church with me now. And I want to marry him. And again, the feelings come over her eyes as wool and blinders despite all the warnings and pleadings from her Christian parents and family and friends. And she decides to marry him anyways. And now that he gets what he wants, suddenly, unexpectedly, surprisingly, he doesn't want to go to church anymore. Wow, what a shock. He's not interested to hear about the Bible anymore. He has no desire to pray anymore. Nor does he want the kids to go to church with her at the very least. And it's a battle every single Sunday and every other day of the week. And now she's miserable and she's stuck. Or vice versa. It's a Christian young man with an unbelieving young woman. You get the picture. And that's at best. That's at best. Look, for those young men and women who aren't yet married but are in a relationship with an unbeliever, that's the best you can hope for, that they'll come to church with you now sometimes. And you talk to them about your faith sometimes now, and you pray with them sometimes now. But that's not a guarantee they're going to believe at all. Because regeneration, being given a new heart and new life in Christ, is individual. It is a sovereign work of God. And whether or not God will do that in their life. Yes, he can use your witness and influence, but there's no guarantee of that. Most often, they're just going to church with you and at best for you, not for themselves. And more often than not, once they then get what you want, what they want, you, in marriage, it's over. And that's if you are praying for and with them and modeling the life of a regenerate, faithful believer in Christ for them. If you're not doing that, if you're not living faithfully, if you're not witnessing to them, if you're not opening the Bible to them and teaching them, why in the world would you even expect them to ever believe or to come to church? You're the only Bible they'll ever read, and you have shut yourself to them. Why? It's foolishness. It's foolishness. And more, if your boyfriend isn't interested in going to church with you while you're dating, or your girlfriend isn't interested in going to church with you while you're dating... Why in the world would you ever think they would once they finally get what they want and the ring's on the finger? They wouldn't. You're already locked in and it's too late. They won't. They won't. That's a dead giveaway. 
And if that's you here this morning, or if you have a loved one or friend, you need to warn them to get out of that relationship and suffer a little bit of heartache now in the present before you end up suffering a life of heartache and headache for the rest of your life in marriage. Do you know how painful and messy it gets when children are involved? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. There'll be someone else out there Be patient, be faithful, trust in God. He or she is not the one for you. That I can tell you in chapter and verse. That's Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 39. Clear as day, clear as day. In that verse, he tells us, by way of a specific scenario, remarriage, Counseling a woman, a a widow, yeah, get married, you can get remarried, that's fine. Your husband dies, no problem, but only in the Lord. And so by necessary application and principle, which we can deduce from that, that also includes for your first marriage, only in the Lord. It's not my words. It's the word of God. Or as Paul says it elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Do not be unequally yoked. And in general, he's talking about with relationships that are going to corrupt and pervert you and distract you from your faith and possibly lead you astray, just like it did with God's own people, whom Paul also says in a first corrective letter to the Corinthians happened to Israel by way of negative example. We need to learn from their mistakes. And he says the same thing now. Do not be unequally yoked with any kind of person in that kind of close and intimate union. And in particular in marriage, that word yoke is the same one that Jesus is going to use here in the context in Mark 10, 9. Yoke. It has to do with a a deep relationship, a a oneness between man and woman in marriage. That's clear. That's clear as day. And so now you know that if you marry that unbelieving young man or if you marry that unbelieving young woman, You are choosing to deliberately disobey God's intention for marriage and for your life by unequally yoking yourself in a covenant before the holy, holy, holy God. It's your choice to make. And we'll look at just what God's intention for marriage is when we finish up the rest of this passage next week as the basis for why he hates marriage and also the biblical exceptions for divorce. God hates divorce because it goes directly against his intention for and design of marriage. But it's not all bad news. For those of you here this morning or watching online that have been through a divorce, whether by your choice or not, or maybe even for biblical grounds, and you understand the pain and the agony that comes with that and lasts for life, there is hope. And there is forgiveness transforming gospel, power, hope, and forgiveness. Because God is a gracious and loving God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness from generation to generation. And in no greater way did God express his loving kindness and graciousness towards us than when he freely gave up his son to die in our place to forgive our sins while we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins while we were sinners. All of our sins, including divorce, God will not forever hold that against you. In fact, if you believe in Jesus, you've been saved by Jesus, and you're following Jesus 
then you have already been forgiven by God in Jesus. He does not consider you to be in a perpetual state of sinful adultery until the day you die or until the day he comes, you, comes again. No, when he breathed his last on the cross, he said, it is finished. And so it is. Your slate has been wiped clean. All of your sin, including divorce, the moment you first believed in and trusted in him by faith and by faith alone. 